Chapter 39 Link's torch flickered and finally died, leaving nothing beyond a few glowing embers at the tip of the blackened stick. He left it behind. It no longer mattered, as light filtered down through the leaves overhead. Though he was still surrounded by trees, they were no longer oppressive and dark. Instead, they, like the ones near the entrance, were tall and verdant, with long, thick limbs and deep roots and they shivered with movement. He assumed for a time that the movement was just because of wind and animals, which he saw in much greater frequency now that he was out of the Lost Woods. However, as he looked up, just like in his memory, he soon saw one of the woodland Koroks poke its head down through the tree. The Korok looked at him in what he assumed was curiosity before disappearing back into the covers of leaves, a sound like a wooden rattle, echoing as it moved. He continued. The light from above grew brighter, though he didn't know if it was dawn or if the canopy thinned. More Koroks appeared. Some of them peered down at him, through the branches from above, while others poked their heads around tree trunks and up from tall grass. Others still hung from vines, swaying slightly in the wind. None of them spoke, but simply watched. Their faces were obscured by leaves of different shapes, sizes, and colors, save for openings for eyes and mouths. His body ached, and not just from the wounds he suffered in his battle against the wolfos. He was tired. His arms hung loosely by his side. His feet felt like lead weights. How long had it taken him to get through the Lost Woods? Time felt strange within them. He knew he slept some, but for how long? Had it only been a day or longer? Weeks? I made it, he said. His voice sounded harsh. He was thirsty, as well as hungry. But he'd made it. Ahead, the trees broke. His heart leaped when he saw the meadow, so much like it had been a century prior. He could see small streams of water and the pea pod like plants that would provide illumination in the night. He could see dozens of Koroks, hundreds in all directions. They were made up of all sizes, including one that towered over all the others. It held a pair of maracas in hand, but it remained as silent as the rest of them. He could also see the base of the towering Diku tree, large and imposing, with a trunk as wide around as a castle's tower. And finally, as he passed through an enormous hollow tree trunk into the meadow, he could see the sword. The Master Sword stood pristine in its stone slot, just as it had in Link's memory. Its small dais was in the shape of a triangle, with a raised stone in the center, where the sword extended out of it. At each of the three corners of the platform was a standing stone, though whatever engravings had once adorned them had long since faded with time. The platform was surrounded by grass and flowers, including several of the white-blue flowers that he had seen in Zelda's study. Link stopped walking, eyes on the beautiful sword. He thought back to his memories of wielding it. The dread. The burden. And he doubted. What if? Well, well. It's you. Link looked up as the Deku tree spoke. Its deep, sombrous voice filled the meadow, and the trees around him shivered, as if in anticipation. You finally decided to return, it said. And then it smiled. It is, of course, good to finally see you again. After so long, even I had begun to wonder if you would ever come. Link cleared his throat, stepping forward, but not standing upon the Master Sword's dais. I... 
I'm sorry that it took me so long. Better late than never, the Deku tree chuckled softly, and Link saw a flock of birds take flight from its upper boughs. I trust that you had no trouble making your way through the forest. It nearly killed me, Link said. Still no recollection of past events then. It is very impressive that you made it through the forest. Do you know who I am? I remember some things. You're the Deku Tree. I remember pulling the Master Sword before. You spoke to me. You called me the Child of Destiny. Yes. It pleases me that you remember that much. But I assume that you do not remember the path through the forest. No, I... Link glanced at the sword. I think it called me. I heard its voice. To my torch. Indeed. If you had but recalled your first entrance into my forest, you would have known how to call upon a guide to lead you through. However, I believe that this is better. A trial, if you will. A guide? I could have called upon a guide? Deku Tree, I... What did Link want to say? What could he say? He spent the last two weeks imagining this moment, of finally reaching the Master Sword. And now that he was here, why did he feel so hesitant? Why did he still refuse to step up onto the pedestal? Hmm? He licked his lips and cleared his throat again, trying to rid his voice of its hoarseness. How did you know? You said back then that you knew I would be the one. But I... I never spoke with you before that. I never did anything to suggest... Nothing that I can remember. Anyway... When you have lived as long as I have, dear boy, certain things appear more readily than others. You and the princess, your very souls shine in a way that no others do. You have the spirit of the hero. The same spirit as the man much like you, who first wielded that sword. Many eons ago. I knew the moment I watched you enter my realm. There have been others like me, Link said. Have any of them ever failed? Fallen as I did? The Deku Tree remained silent for a long time, looking at Link. Finally, he spoke again. Yes. The goodness of your heart does not ensure success. But why do you ask such a question? Why do you claim to have failed? Because I did. I died. Or nearly so. Hyrule was destroyed. Zelda was forced to seal Ganon away for 100 years while I recovered. Nearly, it said. Hyrule was nearly destroyed. You nearly failed. Dear boy, do you truly believe that none of the heroes that came before you suffered defeat and setback? Do you believe that they had it easier than you? Link said nothing. Eyes fixed on the great face. I have watched over this land for time immemorial. I have witnessed many heroes' journeys. You are not the first to claim that sword. And the princess was not the first to return it to its place when its master was unable to do so. Yet I still stand. This land remains. You still draw breath. The kingdom fell, though. Countless people died. People that I should have been able to protect. His father. His sister. His family, friends. Those that counted on him. Death is simply a part of life. As one learns over the course of millennia. Life gives way to death, which gives way to new life. Much like the changing of seasons. Yes, many perished in Calamity Ganon's rise as many often do when great evil comes upon the land. You cannot save them all. You must protect those you can, 
and accept those you cannot. And what of the goddess? What of Hylia? Link's voice grew stronger. Does she not have the power to stop this from happening? From destroying Ganon once and for all? No, the Deku said simply. She does not. That is why many eons ago, she gave up her place in the heavens above to be reborn among her people. A Hylian woman who would wield the power of the goddess and be capable of calling upon the power of the goddess that came before her. He opened his mouth, but the Deku tree continued on before he spoke. And that is why also so many eons ago, she created the Master Sword and chose one much like you who would wield it. This is a cycle throughout time. Yes, the evil one may emerge, and there will always be two who will rise to meet it. So if I defeat Calamity Ganon, it will just rise again in the future. Perhaps. Or perhaps this shall be the final contest between the champions of Hylia and the one given power by demise. Only time shall tell. But I ask you now, does it matter? Does it make any difference in what you will do? Link looked up at the Deku tree, a lump forming in his throat. The weight of their conversation bore down on him. The legacy of the heroes that came before him. The expectation. The destiny. No, he said finally. He stepped up onto the dais and approached the Master Sword. Its blade shone in the light from above. It was perfect and without blemish, rust, or mark. The hilt was just as he remembered it. Purple wings extended towards the blade, with a golden gem between them, and the grip was wrapped in green leather in a cross-hatched pattern. Yet, the Master Sword lying on the ground beside him, its blade pocked and cracked, covered in spots of rust and decay, its light had long since faded. It was dying, just as he was. The images flashed through his head, and Link's hand outstretched towards the hilt, stopped. He could remember holding the sword, staring with horror at its decayed state. He withdrew his hand. I... I almost destroyed it, he said, his voice a whisper. It was almost lost. And yet, like yourself, now stands in my presence, whole and ready to fight again. The Deku Tree said. Link looked up at the tree, and then closed his eyes. He saw images of all those people whom he failed before. Faces that he still didn't know. A people who had counted on him. And a people who still did. He opened his eyes and took another step forward reaching out and placing his hand on the Master Sword's hilt, just as he had one hundred years prior. Memories. Memories. He could remember, all at once, a hundred different moments in his life, presenting the sword to his wide-eyed father and confused sister, whispers in the streets of Castletown, Zelda's scorn, facing down Yiga, facing down hordes of monsters, practicing in the boughs of a tree while rain streamed down all around. Sitting in the grass beside Zelda as she examined a flower, protecting her and being protected by her. He saw guardians, he saw fire, and he saw her shining with the light of a goddess standing before him. And then, then, he saw her, alone. She held the Master Sword, wrapped in a cloth. Her ceremonial robes were dirty and torn, and her hair was disheveled. She poured dozens of scratches, and even burns, but none of them were serious. Link had taken the worst of the attacks for her. Zelda approached the dice with the Master Sword and knelt, slowly unwrapping the blade. It was nearly gone. The blade bore so many cuts and chips that it was a wonder it hadn't broken completely. Yet, life still remained within it. 
Its voice, weak though it was, still led her on. Had he ever heard it? If he had, he never told her. Though she supposed that she only did ever ask him once. And that was long before they grew close. Your master will come for you, she said, as she gently touched the blade with dirty, trembling fingers. Until then, you shall rest safely here. Her hand retreated, and she clasped it with her other between her breasts in prayer. But to whom did she pray? She wasn't even sure anymore. Not now. Not after all that had happened. Not after her own power awakened. I do not know how long it will take, but please trust me when I say I know he will arrive before you yet again, she said. I just hope... I hope that he will remember. Link gasped as the memory washed over him. It was no memory of his own, and he saw it nonetheless. He looked down at the sword, now so pristine and whole. Somehow it had imparted that final moment with Zelda to him. Thank you, he whispered. He grasped it with both hands and lifted it smoothly from the stone. He turned the Master Sword so that it pointed up into the heavens. As he did so, wind swirled around him, whooshing through the grass and flowers. The leaves in the trees whispered, and he heard hundreds of Koroks rattling with it. As he held the sword, he felt a familiar presence settle within his mind. The spirit of the sword itself finally rejoined with that of its master. The master sword felt right in his hands. Its balance was comfortable and exact. Its length was not too long nor too short. Even its hilt appeared to fit his grip in a way no other sword ever had. It was as if the sword had been made specifically for him, to one day hold. He supposed that, perhaps, it had been. The Koroks came to him after he drew the sword, carrying with them an elaborate scabbard of blue and gold. He could recognize it as the same one that he wore before, yet he hadn't seen the scabbard in his memory of Zelda with the sword. When he asked about it, however, they merely giggled and darted off. He sat cross-legged off to one side of the meadow. It was actually very close to where he'd set up camp with Sir Russell in his memory, in the shadow of a massive root coming off the Deku tree. He held the Master Sword in his lap, tracing his fingers along the flat of the blade. He briefly fingered the triangle symbol at the base of the blade, wondering. This emblem, with its three triangles formed together to make a larger triangle, was one that he'd often seen especially in relation to the royal family. He closed his eyes, quiet in his thoughts, and tried to focus on the presence in his mind. The spirit of the sword. It was difficult to understand, as it did not often speak with words as much as vague feelings. Yet it was there, and he thought that it was distinctly feminine. He thought that he could even almost make out a face, yet it was just out of reach. What happened to you? He asked silently. You were destroyed, but why? And how are you whole now? The sword responded with a single word. Hope. But along with the word, she also gave him a vague sense of context. The loss of hope and something else. It hadn't just been that he'd been discouraged when Ganon rose, but it was the overwhelming sense of despair. Pain. Agony. It had been enough to nearly destroy the very spirit of the hero that resided within him, and that spirit was inexorably tied to the Master Sword itself. Yet the Master Sword was whole again, not because of its own hundred-year slumber, but because the spirit of the hero lived again. Link had hope again. He had courage. He thought that he understood, as he quietly acknowledged a simple truth about himself, he was different now than when he had first awoken. It wasn't just the confidence that he could ultimately defeat Ganon. In truth, he still didn't know how that was even possible. But he now understood why he fought. 
and why he would continue to fight, no matter what happened. He still did not fully understand why he had been chosen, but all doubt in his mind about the fact had been erased. He was the chosen hero. He was the bearer of the Master Sword. And he would be the one to save this land, or die trying. He opened his eyes again, looking down at the sword with a small smile played across his lips. When he first drew it, the Master Sword had seemed like such a burden. He hadn't wanted it. Yet now, it felt like an old friend returning home. He reached over to grasp the scabbard, sliding the sword into it. Then he noticed something else on the ground next to the scabbard that hadn't been there before. It was a tunic, deep green in color. It came with an undershirt as well that matched the pale tan of his trousers. One of the Koroks delivered this. Link picked up the tunic, and as he did so, there was a puff of smoke and green light under it that startled him. Yeah. Suddenly, a Korok stood where the tunic had been, looking up at Link. It waved its stubby tree branch hands at him, giggling. How did... And then the Korok disappeared with another puff of smoke, leaving Link feeling... bemused. Of all the creatures that he had encountered on his travels, these had to be the strangest. Turning his attention back to the tunic, he unfolded it and found that there was another garment wrapped up within it. At first, Link thought it was a long sock of sorts, but it was too big for that. After examining it, he realized that it was a kind of floppy hat. It ended in a point that would hang down to his shoulder blades. He hadn't seen anything like it since waking. He set the hat down and pulled on the undershirt. His wounds from the forest had healed the moment he drew the Master Sword. Mipha's healing powers had seemingly been energized somehow by the magic within the sword itself. Then he pulled on the tunic over it. He stood up, moving his arms and shoulders. The tunic fit well, though the fabric felt... old. Even the stitching seemed reminiscent of an older age. He belted on his equipment belt, shield, holster, and scabbard. Link then eyed the hat dubiously. He picked it up again and after a moment, slipped it onto his head. As he expected, the point rested right above his shoulder blades, just above his shield and scabbard. Its point tickled the back of his neck. He turned his head this way and that, and finally reached up and pulled the hat off of his head. Why would anyone even wear this? He wondered, as he rolled it up and placed it in the pouch at his waist. Dressed and feeling comfortable, he turned and began walking the same path that he walked with Zelda so long ago. As he did so, he let his mind wander. In that moment, that he had pulled the Master Sword, dozens of memories had flashed through his mind. Many of them were mere glimpses at the time, yet now that he had time to reflect on some of them, more came to mind. He reached up and plucked a leaf from a tree, examining it. He smiled slightly as he turned it over in his hand. Even now, little of what Zelda said when walking through the forest with him made much sense to him. Yet she loved her research, her puzzles. Curiously, he reached down and pulled out one of the two small books that he had kept in his pouch. This one was Zelda's old diary. The escape into the moat had done considerable damage to it causing the ink to run in many places and ruining other pages entirely. But several sections were still legible now, and he dried it out. He carefully turned to a page that he had read several times, following his escape from the castle. Zelda's handwriting was neat, if a little bit cramped, and some of the words were difficult to make out. Yet the words on the page warmed him. I am unsure how to put today's events into words. Words so often evade me lately, but now more than ever. He saved me. Without a thought for his own life, he protected me from the ruthless blades of the Yaga clan. Though I've been cold to him all this time, taking my selfish and childish anger out on him at every turn. Still, he was there for me. I won't ever forget that. Tomorrow I shall apologize for all that has transpired between us, and then I will try talking to him. To Link. 
it's worth a shot. The next page had been ruined, unfortunately. But that was fine. He could remember the following day without it. Was it really possible for it to be even hotter? Link grimaced as he stepped out of the small tent that had been his home in the desert since they first arrived. He was located beside the tall, imposing walls of Gerudo Town, surrounded by others like him. Men who had come to the city for one reason or another, but found themselves unable to enter. Many were merchants, who had wanted to set up at the Oasis Bazaar. Others were, oddly, husbands or men hoping to become husbands of the exotic women. The Gerudo culture was very strange indeed. He walked over to the water barrel and lifted the lid off of it. There had been a sandstorm the night prior, but the barrel had done its job of keeping the water inside pure. He wasn't entirely sure how the Gerudo managed to keep the water so clean considering the sand that coated everything, but he'd heard the princess speaking of it one day. Something to do with underground filtration and daily cleaning of the aqueduct. Princess Zelda. The day prior had been something new. Something different. Even now he wasn't entirely certain that he fully understood everything that had happened. She snuck out of the city, supposedly intent on doing some shopping in the bazaar without any minders, only to be found by the Iga. He shivered at the thought of the assassins. It hadn't been her first encounter with them, he found out later that evening. They had been so close. If he had been even a second slower, a half step behind, if he had stumbled or chosen to search elsewhere, if almost anything had gone differently, then Princess Zelda would be dead. But she wasn't. Link saved her, taking the life of one of her would-be assassins in the process. That was another thought that left him feeling cold inside. Despite the training and exercises, he had never taken the life of another person before. He pushed the lifeless body of the assassin from his mind. Instead, thinking back on the princess. His princess. Something changed deep within him when he saw her running from the Yiga. Before, his need to protect her had merely been about duty. Now, however, he felt that need burning within him, with a fire unlike anything he'd felt before. He'd killed for her, and he would do so again without hesitation. He would place himself between her and the sword, if it meant keeping her safe. Of course, he wasn't entirely certain that the princess felt the same way. After he'd escorted her back to the city, she'd gone in with barely a word. She was shaken up, of course, he didn't doubt that. But she had thanked him. He wondered what would happen now, after the initial rush of emotions had time to cool. Would she still resent him? Could he somehow earn her trust? Could he let her know that he felt the burden too? He lifted the ladle of water to his lips and took a long draw on it, relishing its coolness. It was always best early in the morning, before the sun had time to warm the barrel after the night's chill. After taking a couple more drinks, he lifted the ladle over his head and poured water over top of himself, gasping softly as the chilly water ran down his face and bare chest. Oh, said a soft voice behind him. He whirled, holding the ladle defensively, and opened his eyes wide when he saw Princess Zelda standing behind him. She was dressed in the filmy garb that the Gerudo wore, colored purple with gold trim, with a lopsided sarong around her waist. Her hair was pulled up in a high tail in the Gerudo fashion. She wore jeweled bangles on her arms, and a thin circlet on her head, with a teardrop sapphire hanging down to her forehead. It was enough to render him speechless. For a moment they stared at each other, and he saw her eyes dart from his face to the ladle he still held up, almost like a sword prepared to strike. Her expression grew uncertain. Um, I can come back, she said. I should have informed you that I was coming to speak with you, perhaps a messenger. Or I should have at least given you time to wake up and... No, he said quickly, shaking his head. He felt hyper alert at the sight of her, and his eyes darted for any potential signs of danger. His heart raced. However, he wasn't entirely certain that it was due to fear of another attack. 
Well, I... She hesitated, still looking between his face and the ladle. Are you certain? If you need time to refresh yourself, or... Finally, Link met her eyes and felt his face flush. He dropped the ladle into the barrel of water behind him. Sorry, I... <clears throat> he cleared his throat. What can I do for you, your highness? I would like to speak to you about some matters. Would you walk with me? Down to the bazaar. He felt a chill run down his back at the mention of the bazaar. The sight of the attack. There was a hopeful expression in her face, however, that caused any suggestions otherwise to die on his lips. He nodded, and she gave him a rare smile. She allowed him the chance to slip on his tunic and master sword, and fill his water skin. Then together the pair of them began the journey down to the Karakara Bazaar. The walk to the bazaar was not particularly far, in comparison to the grandness of the desert, but it would take at least an hour to walk there. Many Gerudo preferred to use seal-pulled sleds, or even the rare horse, to travel there. There was enough traffic between the city and bazaar, that a rough path of packed sand had been carved through the dunes, though the sandstorm from the other night prior did much to cover it up with fresh sand. He noticed that there seemed to be even more foot traffic along the path than usual, mostly armed Gerudo women, clearly on high alert after the assassination attempt. They walked in silence for a time, as they often did, and Link fell back a few steps so that he walked just behind the princess. She glanced at him as he did so, but said nothing at first. After a time, however, he saw her clench her fist in a way she often did before stealing herself to say something. He prepared himself for the angry comment that would surely follow. Sir Link, she said, her voice soft. I would actually prefer if you walked beside me. She glanced back at him, if you would please. He looked at her in confusion. Her request went in the face of much of what he'd been taught as a knight, and by his father. Even his father, whom the king himself called friend, always showed the proper respect and deference when performing his duties. Then again, he also spoke of times when the king and he would often speak more frankly with each other, when in private settings, and he was off-duty. So, which did this qualify for? They were alone, as they often were, but he still had a duty to perform. Her expression decided it for him, however. She looked at him with an expression that was quite unlike what he normally saw when she looked at him. He didn't see anger, spite, or resentment. Instead, she looked nervous. Link swallowed his own apprehension and stepped forward so that he walked by her side. As he did so, he caught the briefest flash of a triumphant smile across her lips before she looked forward, carefully controlling her expression again. What is she doing? And yet the silence continued. It felt strange to walk side by side with this woman, and he realized with some surprise that he didn't think of her as a girl any longer. Though she was still a mere sixteen years old, Something had changed within his own perception of her. The conversation with Herbosa revealed a great deal about the strength Princess Zelda had, and why seeing her as a youth was a mistake. Link turned his head just enough to look at her out of the corner of his eye, taking in her appearance. She no longer looked pale due to the tan that had developed in their week-long trip to the desert. She normally wore clothes that covered her arms and legs, but it would appear that, based on her tan skin, She'd taken to wearing Gruda style clothing often while here, though he hadn't ever seen her wearing such things in his presence. What changed now? Not that he disliked the attire on her. Quite the opposite, actually. She glanced toward him, and he quickly looked forward again. Damn, he thought. Walking beside her like this makes it difficult to think. He heard the princess take a breath beside him, and again he prepared himself for whatever she might say. What would his father say if he found out that his son, the royal knight and bearer of the Master Sword, was appreciating the sight of the princess in Gerudo clothing? I have something that I would like to ask you, she said. He glanced at her, brow furrowing slightly. Yes, your highness. I spoke with Herbosa yesterday after everything happened. She told me that you volunteered to check the bazaar. 
Why did you think I would go there? He hesitated. The bazaar had seemed like the most reasonable place for him to check. Gerudo were being sent far and wide, but he had no horse in the desert. The bazaar seemed natural to him. I... It seemed like the only place I could easily check, he said finally. Urbosa seemed to be checking everywhere else in port. I see. She frowned, considering. And... She looked back at him quickly. Link hesitated for a few moments before speaking again. I guess I thought that it might have been a likely place for you to go. Why would you say that? I thought after what happened the day before, you might have wanted a break from studying for a time, and... He stopped, worried that what he was about to say might be misconstrued or viewed as offensive. Please, go on. He met her eyes and felt his pulse quicken. You prefer not having guards, so I thought you might have disguised yourself and snuck out to have some time to yourself. Not to the Divine Beast, where you would have been easily found, but somewhere you could blend in with the crowd. He paused and then added, Your Highness. Her eyes widened and a curious smile appeared on her lips. That is surprisingly astute, Sir Link. I had not realized that I was so transparent. You aren't, he thought. Most of the time, you're maddening, confusing, irrational. But I think I understand why now. You seem to know me so well, yet I know so little about you, she said, her smile fading, and she looked down, exhaling in a huff. And I fear that is my fault. Princess? She took a deep breath before halting and standing up straighter. He stopped as well, confused. They were alone, halfway between the bazaar and the city. Princess Zelda looked up to meet his eyes. Sir Link, I have... I owe you an apology, a real apology, though you have never done anything to deserve such. I have mistreated you, and often. It's not... She held up a hand to silence him. Please, let me finish. He fell silent, swallowing. Princess Zelda kept her eyes on his. You saved me yesterday. Despite the fact that I have done nothing to deserve your dedication, you placed yourself between me and the blade that would have surely ended my life. Even though you were outnumbered three to one, you still came to my aid. My duty... She gave him a look that silenced him again. Yes, I know of your duty. And I know that you likely would have done the same for anyone else you were sworn to protect. Perhaps even anyone else that you saw in danger. But that is immaterial. The fact that you saved me. And your actions have encouraged me to see things in a new light. We are both here because of duty. Her eyes briefly flickered towards the Master Sword. But then they were back on his. I know that I have not been pleasant to be around. I apologize for my poor attitude. And the harsh words I have said to you. You've done nothing to deserve such behavior, and it shames me to think of it now. Link remained silent, though part of him fought. He had only just yesterday realized the things he'd been doing, or not doing, to contribute to her burden. And now she was apologizing to him? It felt wrong just to stand there. I hope that, though I'm sure that I don't deserve it, I do hope that you will forgive me. And I hope that we can start anew. She fell silent, looking at him uncertainly. He waited for her to continue, but when she didn't, he licked his lips, opening his mouth. But what did he say? He wouldn't refuse her request. He already knew that. But did he even truly have a choice? As the silence between them stretched, Princess Zelda's expression began to fall. Finally, he cleared his throat. Of course, your highness. Though, you didn't have to... Again. She held up a hand, looking frustrated. Stop. Just... Enough of the your highnesses and princesses. Do I look like a princess right now? Yes, he admitted silently, as he looked at her. The sapphire in the center of her forehead sparkled in the morning light of the desert. It offset the color of her eyes. You really do. 
I want... I need to know. She sighed, closing her eyes. It is all right. If you do not forgive me, I don't deserve it. Do not feel you must do so because of your duty. This has nothing to do with that. Link wasn't so sure, but he didn't contradict her. He did, however, take another moment to consider. He considered all that he'd learned about the princess and their travels together, and what Urbosa had told him as well. He considered her personality, her dedication, and really, how difficult the moment must have been for her. She had a great deal of pride. Finally, he spoke again. I forgive you. Truly. She held his gaze for a moment longer, as if she were looking for something else. Finally, she smiled, though it appeared to be forced to him. Thank you. She turned and began walking again, but Link remained where he stood. Princess. She stopped, turning back to face him. You... <clears throat> he cleared his throat. How did he say this? You asked me the other night what I thought of you. Her cheeks grew flush. Yes? I didn't have an answer at the time, Link said. I know that likely seemed callous at the time. I apologize, but I have one now if you would hear it. Go on. There was something in her eyes now. An excitement that hadn't been there before. I think that you are a very... dedicated woman. He frowned. No. That sounded too formal, too emotionless. In fact, I don't think I've ever met someone as dedicated to their purpose as you are. I've seen you perform your daily prayers without ceasing, even when you don't know when I am around. Her cheeks flushed even deeper at this. Perhaps the wording could have been better. He quickly pressed on. The point is that I know how difficult it must be for you. And I respect your perseverance. I don't know why the goddess has not yet granted what you seek. But I do not think it is because of any fault of your own. And I'm sure that, in time, your powers will surface. She adopted a carefully controlled expression. One that Link knew well. He had seen her use it dozens of times, whether speaking to him, to her father, or to any number of others. He didn't know what emotions lay beneath its surface, and he immediately worried that he'd said the wrong thing. I appreciate that, Sir Link, she said. It is very kind of you to say. Link flexed his fingers, feeling uncertain. Could he truly say what was on his lips now? She began to turn again, but he held out his hand as if to stop her. She raised her eyebrows, looking at his outstretched hand. Please, I'm not... I hadn't finished, he said. Uncertainty flashed through Princess Zelda's expression, and she turned back to him again. I, uh... I also think you are among the most intelligent people I've ever met. This got a reaction from her. The corners of her lips quirked upwards. The way you understand the Divine Beasts and how they work... It's... all far above my head. But it's fascinating, and sometimes it seems like you wish you had someone you could speak to about your theories. I'm not sure how much intellectual conversation I can provide you, but... I am willing to listen, if you'd like... In fact, I'd like to think I'm pretty good at it. This did it. Princess Zelda stifled her laugh, but she grinned nonetheless. It was the first time she had ever given such an expression to Link, and it transformed her into something completely different. Something that made his heart race in a way few had since he'd drawn the Master Sword, and the burden of responsibility had settled onto his shoulders. Traitorous thoughts accompanied this revelation. Dangerous thoughts. That, Sir Link is something that I would be happy to do. She stepped forward, holding out her hand. He stared at the outstretched hand as if it were a venomous viper. She did not retract it, however, looking at him intently. Finally, he reached out and took her hand, shaking it. 
Her hand was very soft and warm. Thank you, she said as they released each other's hands. I truly needed to hear that. Shall we continue on? He nodded and together they began to walk side by side again. You know, she said after a few more moments of silence, you are very difficult to get talking. Which I think is a shame, for when you start you speak with more insight than most. She looked up at him. I hope you know that I'm willing to listen as well, when you have things that you need to say. He looked down at her, meeting her eyes. His heart still raced, and he felt warm in a way that had nothing to do with the hot sun overhead. He nodded. She smiled. Dangerous thoughts. <laughs>